All right, so as far as announcements go, the homework assignment that you've got on your plate right now is due Thursday. So you've got two more days to complete that. It should be uploaded to MU Online before class at 8 o'clock on Thursday. Uh, we've just had our first quiz, and today we're going to be covering uh, two different topics. The first is minimum attractive rate of return, and that comes from Chapter 1 in the book. And then we're going to get into uh, the interest factors in more detail. And we've uh, talked about it kind of tangentially so far, but we're going to really focus on it today. You'll notice that here I've put the uh, sections in the book that the material is related to. And so I'd renew my suggestion that you really ought to be reviewing each of these topics in the textbook after class. You know, this is a good first taste that you're getting here. You know, we're doing a little bit of lecture, a little bit of problem solving, but you'll remember it best and you'll understand it, understand it best if you also review what the author has to say on these same topics. So uh, I invite you to do that. Um, here's a table that is showing the effect of compounding. And it's kind of interesting to look at for each of these different interest rates that are nominal, meaning uh, that's the interest rate that's being quoted per year. If the compounding frequency increases, what it actually has in an as an effective rate. We talked about the difference between nominal and effective interest rates in class last Thursday. But what you can see is that as you increase the compounding frequency, you have these marginal increases in effective interest rate. So what I mean is, if you go from one compounding period to two per year, the increase you can see is 0.09%. But then if you double it again, you don't get another 0.09%. That time, as it increases, it's just an addition of 0.05. And so there are diminishing returns as you increase the frequency of compounding. Of course, the higher the nominal interest rate was, the bigger the difference between the effective and the nominal interest. So that's just to refresh your memory about the difference between nominal and effective, and the fact that as the interest rate is big to begin with, the effective compounding frequency is more important. And does anybody remember what kind of a loan is likely to have these highest interest rates? Credit card. That's exactly right. Yeah, credit cards, which are unsecured. Those, uh, those loans that don't have collateral that could be seized if you fail to repay your loan. By the way, did everybody notice the uh, solutions to the first homework are posted on MU Online? So um, this semester, you're going to be graded, your homework assignments are going to be graded on uh, a pretty rough scale. Uh, the, the homework grader doesn't have a lot of time to dig in and provide you with too much feedback. And so uh, what I've decided to do is kind of shift the burden of understanding the solution onto the students. And I think that there's probably a better opportunity for learning that way anyhow. If it's kind of on you to compare what you did to the solution and find what the mistake is. And if you have questions, you can stop by and I'll explain the, uh, the correct solution to you if there was a mistake. But um, the, the grades that you got on the first homework assignment, just because you got 27 out of 27 doesn't necessarily mean you did everything right. It just means that for this first assignment, I gave full credit as long as you attempted the problem. So please do look through the uh, solutions that are posted online. Okay, <clears throat> now this is a really important figure that I've simplified from your textbook. Uh, I've simplified it because I want to introduce it in steps. And uh, this first curve, what it's showing is that on the horizontal axis, it's the amount of money that you can think of a company has borrowed from a lending institution. And so what it's showing is on the vertical axis, the interest rate that they have to pay for the privilege of borrowing money. So when they borrow a million dollars from the bank, the bank requires 10% interest. And that 10% reflects a lot of things. It reflects the bank's desire to earn a profit. It reflects the uh, processing charges of you know, uh, doing a credit check, drawing up the paperwork, having a, uh, a physical location where you can go in and meet with people. Those are called overhead costs. And so the 10% is covering profit, overhead, but also it's covering the uh, bank's perception of risk because a certain number of the bank's loans are going to fail. 
and that means that the bank is going to not get paid by some of them. And so they need the loans that do pay off to cover the losses that they incur in the loans that don't pay off. So what we notice is that as the cumulative amount borrowed increases, that the annual interest rate is going up. So anybody care to speculate why that would be? Why the bank is requiring more interest as the amount a company wants to borrow increases? Yeah. Uh, risk goes up, the overhead cost goes up as well. Okay, so the risk and the costs go up. Tell me more about how the risk goes up. If my company is borrowing $6 million from the bank, instead of just $1 million, why is that more risky to the bank? Well, 10% of $1 million is hardly anything, but 10% of $6 million is a lot. Okay, but, but think about the risk. Let's focus on the risk. Why is it more risky to the bank that I've borrowed $6 million instead of $1? The okay, they have the potential to lose more money. That's part of it. And it's probably going to be like a longer term loan. Okay, so now if the duration is longer, there's something that's called interest rate risk. And that is, what if you were loaning somebody money and you said, I'll loan you this money at 3% interest. But then suddenly the economic environment changes and interest rates go up. And this guy that you loan the money to is only paying 3%, but now everybody else who's borrowing money has to pay 10%. And so you're losing out on the opportunity that you could have had to loan money at the higher rate. So if the loan duration increases, there's more interest rate risk, as it's called. Um, I think the biggest risk, though, is now there's a bigger risk that I may not repay. Um, if, if I'm borrowing $6 million, you know, I have a certain number of customers. I have an order book of jobs that I'm going to do, you know, revenue sources lined up. But uh, the more you borrow, the more probable it is that you're bumping up against your ability to repay. Like if the bank sees that you have a certain job, let's say that you're just an engineer working at the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers here in Huntington. You know, typical starting salary would maybe be in the neighborhood of about $50,000 per year. So the bank probably wouldn't be too worried about loaning you $200,000 for a house. They'd see that as a reasonable loan. But if you wanted a million dollars for a house, and your salary is only $50,000 per year, they're going to say, Ugh, he may not be able to make the payments on this. There's a greater risk for default. So that's what the bank is seeing here, is they're seeing that as the cumulative amount borrowed goes up, there's a greater probability that you may not pay back. So keep that trend in your mind. Now, your company wants to do certain projects. There's just this list of projects your company could do to increase its competitiveness, to uh, you know, put together new revenue sources. And so this is just a list of all the projects your company could do to generate more funds. But you don't have enough money to do these just on your own. So you have to borrow the money to do each of them. And with this list of projects, the company has done an analysis of how much each project costs. That's the first thing. And then they've also estimated what their return on investment might be. So they're estimating like the percent return that each one of these projects would bring to them. Now that's what this figure is showing. The blue line is the same thing that it was before. It's just that trend that the more you borrow, the higher the interest rate is going to be that's required by the lender. The other, these bars, the width of the bar represents the amount. And then the height of the bar represents the uh, amount of interest, the, the return you expect for conducting that project. So the first one, A, was upgrade the computer network. So your company right now has a really bad computer network. And through an economic analysis, you've determined that if you spent about $600,000 to upgrade the computer network, then that $600,000 investment would yield a return of 35%. You know, because it would allow you to do your orders more quickly or take in more orders. For whatever reason, you're going to get quite a good return on that just that particular investment, just the $600,000 that you spent on the computers. 
Whereas option B, new delivery trucks, they're more expensive. That's why the bar is wider, is that the new delivery trucks, it looks like they're going to cost about $1.4 million. So the width of the bar is how much you need to borrow to do the project. And then you're going to get a 30% return. So let me ask you a question. Should your company do project A? If you're going to get 35% return, and if the bank is going to charge you 10% to borrow that money, is that a good project to do? Why? I see some heads shaking. Yes, and that's correct. It is a good project. Like, what's the rationale? Like, if you're going to structure it as an if-then statement, what would be the rule you could apply that would tell you whether project A is a yes or a no? Okay, so you're looking at the, uh, the, the rate of return of the project versus the interest rate on the money you're borrowing. So what's the if-then statement? You're right that we want to compare those two. So if you're going to say, if something, then your decision should be blank. So if... Then, then you should make the almost there. Then you should the do the project, make the investment. Good. He's exactly right. He's nailed it. So our decision criteria, I'm going to use that phrase a lot this semester, decision criteria. It's how you know what to do. And this course is all about making decisions to maximize profits or to maximize the benefit to society. So here, the decision criteria for project A is if the rate of return is greater than the interest rate on the money that's being borrowed, do the project. And think of it this way. What if you could go to, there's lots of banks here in town. One of them is Huntington Bank and another is Chase. So let's put it this way. What if you could go to Huntington Bank and borrow $10 million for 10% interest? And then you go to Chase Bank and you take that same money that you just borrowed and you put it into an account that's going to pay 35% interest. That'd be a no-brainer, right? Because all you'd have to do is you'd have to pay back the loan, pay back 10%, and you'd get to keep the difference between the two. And that's what this company is going to do. They're going to borrow money at 10% that they put to work and that the money is going to generate 35%. So they keep the difference. All right, so using that decision criteria, should they do project B? I see some heads nodding yes. Yep, they should do project B because rate of return is bigger than the borrowing costs. Should they do project C? Yes, all right, so I won't go through all of them, but now project F, the figure says to reject project F. What is it about project F that's different than the one before it? How, are, how have things changed with Project F? Think about that rule that we constructed earlier. By the time F, the Project F is done, you're zero profit. Zero profit for Project F, that's right, because the borrowing costs are equal to the rate of return for Project F. So you don't want to do the project and turn all of the profits over to the bank. Then you're just spinning your wheels and you don't get to keep the uh, the payoff and project G is even worse because with project B you're losing money because it's gonna charge it's gonna cost you what probably like 17 percent to borrow all that money and it's only gonna return 14 percent and so the decision criteria is M A R R stands for minimum acceptable rate of return and in our case, the minimum acceptable rate of return is 16% per year because that's the point at which our borrowing costs cross over with our rates of return for all of the project options that we have. Now, one of the rules for constructing a diagram like this is that you have to order it in terms of you put the most profitable projects first and the least profitable projects as a last priority. I mean, it only makes sense that 
um, your highest priority projects should be the ones that have the highest rate of return. And so that's what this ordering is, A, B, C, D, is we intentionally put as our highest priority funding the projects that will return the greatest profits. And so F and G, by the time we get to those lower priority projects, our borrowing costs are high enough that we can't afford to say yes to them. So F and G, uh, new laptops to salespeople, security cameras in the warehouse, we're not doing that. We'll do A through E. Okay, so does that analysis make sense to everyone? I've just introduced some big ideas that we're going to come back to over and over <laughs> through the semester. One of the really important phrases that I've just mentioned is decision criteria. And anytime you make a decision of should you do option A, should you do option B, you have to be prepared to tell me how did you decide? Like what was the rubric or what was the algorithm that you used to pick between the two options? And what I'm telling you is, is our first decision criteria is if your rate of return is greater than the minimum acceptable rate of return, then accept the project. Okay, so minimum attractive rate of return or minimum acceptable rate of return is sometimes called the hurdle rate because that means it's the rate of return that you have to get over before you accept a project. And oftentimes it's a policy decision that the high upper level management of a company is going to pick a minimum acceptable rate of return and there are a lot of factors that go into their decision of what rate of return is enough. And the biggest of those factors, the most important, has to do with what your borrowing costs are. And so there are a lot of different places you can go to get money. You can go to a bank, an investment fund, you can issue bonds or sell stocks. And so you come up with a weighted average of all of the costs of capital that you have. You know, what percent interest do each of these different sources want in order to loan you the money? And you can figure out an interest rate that it's how much it costs you to borrow a certain amount of money. And so you'd never accept a project where the rate of return is less than your weighted average cost of capital. Some companies have lots of options. Other companies are in pretty low margin environments. Like tech companies, Apple, Facebook, Google, they only go for the biggest and the most lucrative ideas whereas there are certain industries that are well known for having low margins and very low profits like grocery stores. Grocery stores are lucky to earn one or two percent return each year because uh, people are very price sensitive when it comes to shopping for groceries and there isn't as much innovation as there is in uh, tech firms. So the number of good projects that you have available can sometimes be measured by the opportunity cost. Has anybody heard that phrase before, opportunity cost? The technical definition for opportunity cost is the value of your second best option. And the idea is you can't do two things at once. You can't be here in this classroom and also working a shift at your job. You have to do one or the other. And so if you're going to be here, the opportunity cost of being here is whatever your second best alternative was, whether it's sleeping in late or working, you know, whatever you were going to do, uh, you can't do. And so that's the opportunity cost. The other factor that goes into the hurdle rate is the amount of risk. And so upper management is going to look at the amount of uncertainty and whether it's really a guaranteed return that we're going to get 35% on the new network or is there some uncertainty there. And, uh, the, the more risk there is of a project not paying off, maybe the higher rate of return we want before we'd accept those risky projects. Now, different types of companies or organizations typically have different MARs. And private industry is going for profits in a way that uh, municipal governments or nonprofit companies aren't really only focused exclusively on rates of return. And so a uh, private industry maybe wants a higher MAR than a hospital where the hospital could be o uh, owned by a nonprofit. Uh, for example, St. Mary's here in town was at least originally owned by a, a nonprofit organization. I think maybe it's been sold at this point, but 
the point is, and we'll talk more about this uh, through the semester, that uh, different types of organizations have uh, different desires for profit. Now, I talked about the weighted average cost of capital, and money comes from a variety of different places. Um, equity financing means that whoever gives you money under an equity financing agreement, they're a part owner of your business. And so if, if you want to sell shares in your enterprise, that's called equity financing. You know, if you and 10 friends were going to buy a food truck together and everyone chips in $10,000 and you're each one-tenth owners, then that's an equity partnership. And so some established companies that have been around a while will decide to go public. Have you heard of an IPO before? When they say, like, Uber is having an IPO, that means that Uber, until now, has been owned by private investors and the, the people who started the company. But suddenly, they want to raise more money, and so they're going to carve up the company into pieces, into shares, and they're going to list those shares on a stock market for sale. So that's an example of equity financing, and that's one way you can raise money, is by bringing in partners to your company. Another way, through debt financing, you're not actually selling someone an ownership stake in your company. All you're doing is you're taking a certain amount of money and you're promising to repay it plus some interest. That doesn't entitle them to a fixed share of your future profits like equity financing does. Because the reason people buy stock is because you, if you're a, if you're a shareholder, you own the future profits. You're entitled to a share of how much money the company is going to make in the future. Uh, if you have loaned money to a company, you don't have that same right. You're not entitled to the future profits. You're only entitled to getting your principal plus interest back. The decision criteria for a project is that the rate of return should be greater than or equal to the minimum acceptable rate of return and that always needs to be greater than the weighted average cost of capital otherwise you'll be losing money on projects okay so any questions on these different types of financing or this restatement of the decision criteria please that's a great uh, that's a very good question so the, the difference in risk between equity and debt. And yes, oftentimes debt financing is considered less risky. Um, you maybe have heard of bonds before. So if you buy bonds from a company, those are considered senior to any claims that shareholders have. So if I own shares of GE and you own GE's bonds and all of a sudden GE goes bankrupt, you're going to get paid before I will. So debts, uh, a debt financing or bond um, is, uh, is a higher priority to, during a liquidation than shareholders are. Great question. And because of that, um, debt financing usually has a lower rate of return than stocks do. And so like if you buy a bond from a company, it may only pay 4 or 5%. Whereas, on average, across the U.S. stock market through history, stocks have paid about between 7 or 8 percent return on average. So shareholders get paid a little bit more than bondholders do on average. Okay. Let's talk a little bit more about opportunity cost. Here's a headline I saw a while back. It was talking about how the uh, aviation industry is facing a crunch of qualified mechanics and how um, there's a high school in New York City that focuses on, it's like a, a technical school, similar to you know how some high schools, I think here in Cabell County they do it where they go to a, a separate high school and learn maybe uh, like machining or welding or carpentry. So this technical school in New York uh, focuses on aviation maintenance and uh, the article goes on to say that the uh, the mechanics who gra graduate from this high school 
within like a year and a half of their graduation, if they get a couple of certifications for aircraft maintenance, they can make $72,000 a year, just with a high school degree and then these maintenance certificates. So you can think of opportunity cost as if you go to college, then you can't begin working immediately. There's some job that you could have done besides going to college. Here's another headline about truck drivers making nearly $90,000 a year, at least until the ro robots take over, right? Because automation is going to put a lot of drivers out of work, unfortunately. It's going to be, uh, if you believe Andrew Yang, it's going to be quite wild. Anybody know who Andrew Yang is? Yeah? He's running for president. His main focus is we have to be really worried about automation because so many people are going to lose their jobs. Uh, hopefully engineers will be okay though. Uh, <laughs> all right, so opportunity cost, the value of the second best option, and it's, you can think of it from a numerical standpoint is if you think of all of the other things you could have done from a project standpoint, you know, if you do the, uh, if you do the network upgrades, and that means now you don't have enough money to do the security cameras, and that was your next best option, then the opportunity cost would be whatever rate of return you would have earned by putting in the security cameras. So it's the largest of all the rates of return of projects that had to be rejected due to a lack of money. So just an illustration. Let's say your minimum attractive rate of return is 10%, and project A would have had a rate of return of 13, but you accepted project B because it has a rate of return of 15. So it's funded because it costs less and because it has a higher rate of return. So your opportunity cost was 13% because you couldn't do that project because you don't have enough capital. So that's just an illustration of how we can think of opportunity costs in terms of percentages. Here is a formula that shows you how to come up with a weighted average. Probably you've done weighted averages before. I, I hope that the, the main concept here isn't anything new. It's just saying that if you get some of your money from selling stock and you get some of your money from bonds and some of your money from borrowing from private investors like a bank, and you know the percent return that you'll have to pay for each of those different investments, then you can come up with a weighted average. It's different from a simple average. A simple average would just be take three things, add them up, and divide by three. This weighted average says that you have to take into account the size of each thing uh, to come up with a weighted average. And so this formula you're going to use in today's uh, in-class exercise, and in fact, um, let's do that now. I've got two parts to today's in-class exercise and uh, let's start by just doing the front page of this one. Let me hand it out here. Let me put the formula for the weighted average cost of capital up on the screen. So here's the formula that you'll need for problem four. All right, we need to press forward with a little bit more speed than often, so let's just take a look at the solution straight away, and you can copy down and compare what you've done to what we've got on the screen. 
So in my own case, what was my opportunity cost for attending university? I probably would have gone to work for a railroad. And so all of the income that I could have made while I was in college, that's the opportunity cost of attending university. Um, maybe the opportunity cost for any one day is you know, a good night's sleep or having more leisurely breakfast. But if you think broadly about all of the time you're spending to get a, a degree, it's the income. All right, problem two, what we're doing is we're comparing these borrowing costs for different types of companies and different durations to different projects. And so this table, an AA company is more safe than an A-rated company. And so single A has higher borrowing costs than a double A company. And if you look for a five-year loan, there's data for triple A companies, double and single. And so the higher the credit worthiness of a company, the lower the borrowing costs are. And that's true for both private companies, but also uh, whole nations. There are certain countries that historically have had really low borrowing costs, like Japan and Germany. They have low borrowing costs. And uh, the United States borrowing costs are pretty low as well because we haven't defaulted and the United States Treasury always pays its debts. But there are certain com uh, countries out there where uh, investors perceive there to be a bigger risk that the country could go bankrupt. A few years ago, Greece was really in the news a lot because of the financial problems that they were having. And borrowing costs in Greece went to about 25% per year. Really hard to uh, pay back your loans when the interest rates are that high. So in this case, what we want to do, our decision criteria is if the project's rate of return is greater than the borrowing costs, then accept the project. And it looks like there are four projects that we can accept because our company is double A rated. So we're going to use these double A interest rates and it says the uh, time frame of the project. And so project A is a yes because 9% rate of return is better than our five-year borrowing costs, which are 2.22%. But project B is a no. So project B, our two-year rate of return is 1%. But it looks like our two-year borrowing costs are 1.32%. So we don't do project B, and so on and so forth. So does that problem make sense to everybody, how we compare the two and use the decision criteria? OK, project uh, problem three is just kind of trying to uh, get you to restate those trends that we saw with the blue line that was going up. Remember why the blue line was getting taller and taller? as the cumulative amount borrowed increased. So a company's credit worthiness may be influenced by how long it's been around, the number of customers they have, the number of projects that are lined up, its history of making revenue. So just think about how does a bank look at a company? A bank isn't going to be influenced by commercials, you know, public relations and that sort of thing. Hopefully whoever is evaluating a loan isn't going to be fooled by the glitz and glamour, but they're going to look more at your ability to repay. And so all of these factors could play into a company's ability to repay. Okay, the fourth problem is where you're going to actually do some calculations here. And I want you to come up with the weighted average of the borrowing costs. So the weighted average cost of capital. So money is going to come to our company from a bank loan. So 25% of the money we need is coming from a bank loan. And the bank loan charges 6.5%. Okay, 45% is going to come from bonds that we have to pay 4.5% on. And then the balance is going to be raised by selling preferred stock where we promise to pay 7.8%. Okay, so the balance is going to be 100 minus 25 minus 45. So the weighted average, if we use this formula, looks like this. So 
is the rate of return that we're paying on the bank loan that 25% of the money came from the bank loan. 45% of the money came from this bond issue. And then the preferred shares are 30%, which we're paying 7.8%. So the weighted average of that is 5.99%. You'll use weighted averages in a lot of different things. Um, if you're a civil engineer, you use weighted average a lot in environmental engineering, where you have uh, rivers coming together with different pollutant levels and so on. Any questions about these first four problems? OK, well, let's talk a little bit more about interest factors. Um, Here is a really important table, and this is taken from the reference manual you can use when you take the FE exam. Is everybody familiar with what the FE exam is? It stands for Fundamentals of Engineering. And um, usually during your senior year or shortly after graduation, students will take the FE exam to become a, uh, a registered engineer in training. And that's a state certification. It's one of the first steps to becoming a licensed professional engineer. So uh, on the exam for the fundamentals of engineering, there are problems related to engineering economy. And they have an, a formula book they give you for the FE exam. And here is the formula book. And uh, remember, we introduced these, <coughs> this symbology of summarizing problems, where it's find F given P at some interest rate for n number of years. And then this is the formula that you'd use for the ratio of f divided by p. Or p divided by f is equal to this formula. Um, this table, I'm going to provide you on the exams. And you can use these formulas. But there's also, for certain interest rates in the back of your book in the appendix, there's these table lookup factors where it's been pre-calculated for you using these same equations. It's just for a certain number of years at a certain interest rate, you can look up what the factor is. And then the factor, so for instance here, 1.4693, that is the ratio of F divided by P for n equals 5 years and an interest rate of 8%. So if you knew what the present value is and you wanted to calculate the future amount, you'd multiply the present value by the factor and that would give you f. And so each one of these columns is a different problem type. And we're going to get lots of practice this semester solving problems like these. All right, so just as an illustration of how to use these, a uh, person deposits 5000 into an account that pays 8% per year. After 10 years, this is really similar to your homework problem. So after 10 years, we could summarize this as a cash flow diagram where you're depositing. And so the arrow is down when you're paying the money. And then the arrow is up when you're withdrawing it, the amount that's available to withdraw. So these table lookup factors, if we go back to the 8% table, n equals 10, so f slash p is 2.1589. So we take that factor, 2.1589, and multiply it by the known amount of 5,000, and that will give you 10,794. So that's an illustration of how you use those lookup factors. Here's another one. A company wants to make a deposit now so that in the future they'll have 50,000. So that's in five years they want to have 50000 So how much should they put in now? Summarizing with a, a cash flow diagram, the unknown is P. The known is F, 10% per year. Uh, there's a 10% table in the back of the book. And if you look on the P slash F column in the 10% table for N equals 5, you'd find that that factor is 0 0.6209. Now, how many significant digits are there in that factor? There's four. So 
One, two, three, four. What that means is we're limited in our ability to, uh, in the answer. We can't report the answer to the nearest penny. It won't be accurate to the nearest penny. We have to round off because there's only one, two, three, four digits in our, uh, in our factor. Probably this should have been rounded off to 31050 because that would be four digits of accuracy. All right, so now in the handout that I've given you, on the subsequent pages after the first page that we've looked at, there are some uh, factor problems here. So problem five, I step you through this idea of, okay, we're not doing that one. All right, this. You receive 50,000 in seven years. What's the present value at 8%? Now the 8% table is on the uh, page 3 as well as the formulas. So I'd like you to first of all summarize this problem according to the language of you know is it A slash P, F slash A and so on and so forth. So summarize it in that standard notation that we use and then identify the formula that you should use from among these that are available, which formula would you use to solve it? And then calculate the factor using that formula. And then solve it both with your equation calculated factor and then also the factor from the lookup table. Alright, so it's important for you to be able to learn the language, like the uh, symbology for how these problems are summarized. So this problem statement of getting 50,000 in seven years and the present value is unknown, the way that you would summarize that is it's a P slash F comma I equals 8 percent N equals 7. And so that notation is going to tell you which page to turn to in the appendix to find the right factor table based on the interest rate. It's going to tell you once you find the right factor table which row to go to because n equals 7. And then it's going to tell you which column to utilize to look up the factor. Okay, so that's part A. Uh, part B, the formula that you'd use if we go to this list of formulas, if we are find P given F, then the formula for find P given F, P slash F is equal to 1 plus I to the negative N power. So that's the formula that you should have for part B. And you can see that it's a ratio. It's the ratio of the present value to the future value. So you know F, and the way you're going to solve this is by substituting in I and N and then moving the F over to the right hand side of the equation and then you'll solve for P in that way. So that's what we do in part C to find the factor, the factor that you calculate, 0.58349 dot 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 means that we keep all the precision in the calculator and we don't round off yet. You round off at the very end when you've actually multiplied it by the money amount and so that we can take it to be accurate to the nearest penny, it should be 29,174 and 52 cents. So that's accurate to the nearest penny. But if we look up the factor table, you know, if we go over here to this factor table and we have P slash F for N equals seven years, and this is the 8% table, 
you'll notice that the factor that's provided is only 0.5835. So that means it's only going to be accurate to four digits. And so if we compare, multiplying that 0.5835 by the known 50,000, then we have to round it off to 29,180. So this one is right to the nearest penny. This answer is right to the nearest $10 if we use the factor table. Any questions about that in-class exercise problem? Okay, now on the back side of the paper are two more questions. You're going to need to do you're going to need to know how to do this for the homework that uh, is going to be submitted on Thursday. So it's really important that you understand this in-class exercise. It will help you on the assignment. Okay, let me put the solution to these two problems up on the screen and see if we all agree. And we'll talk a little bit about rounding. All right, so the first one, table lookup method for, it's a P slash A problem. Find P given A, 8% and equals 3. So if we go to the table for that, find the P slash A column. Here it is for the 8% interest rate and n equals 3, that it's hard to read because it's a bit blurry, but it's 2.5771. So I took that factor, 2.5771, and you multiply that by A and get P. So one of your homework problems is a P slash A type, or actually it might be an A slash P, but the point is is that these annual uniform series, um, they're important to do because monthly payments are a uniform series. A means annual, but it could be monthly, it could be quarterly. Any recurring payment of the same amount. So you'll notice that I rounded off to the nearest dollar here because our factor had one, two, three, four, five digits. And so that means the final answer should have one, two, three, four, five digits that we're accurate to. So I can't say what the cents are for this one. But in the next problem, where it says to use the equation method, so rather than looking up whatever the factor is, we're going to calculate our own factor. So find A given P. So it's an A slash P type. And I don't think in the back of the book there probably isn't a factor table for 11.5% we'd have to calculate it anyway. Those factor tables are usually only for like whole number interest rates. You know, 1%, 2%, 3% .3 generally. Okay, so the formula, if I go down here and I find where is the A slash P formula, again this is more blurry than probably your copy looks like, but A slash P here's the formula for that. That's tough to read. Let me just scroll up and you can see what I've written for the formula. Okay, so I times 1 plus I to the power of N divided by 1 plus I to the N power minus 1. Okay, so that's tricky. We don't want to make any mistakes. Uh, I is 0.115, N equals 3. If you go through all of the steps here, then the factor you're going to calculate is 0.412 should be uh, $3,095.82. All right, it's 9.16. I've kept you one minute late. I'll give you back that minute with interest on Thursday. All right? So that's it for today. Remember, your homework assignment is due before class on Thursday. So I'll see you then.